I think a poem is a is a quite an intimidating object or, or system to sort of be confronted with, generally compared to you know the back of a cereal packet. Um, but part of the problem is reconciling um, the enjoyment that you have reading poetry because it's it is a kind of special language and it does, or at least it feels that way. Um, and there is a sort of a, it does encourage greater investment personally, and I think it's about reconciling that in that personal investment and the enjoyment that brings with the um, critical rigour um, that you need as an academic. So I think for undergraduates that's quite a difficult thing to do, to both feel that they're enjoying a poem, um, but at the same time what they're doing as critics with a poem isn't just sort of vivisection, it's not sort of taking the thing apart, that actually um, appreciation of poetry and enjoyment can, can be the same thing as um, understanding and analysing the way that a poem work, works. So how, how do you develop that critical rigour practically in your seminars? Um, well, there's lots of ways you can approach a poem, um, and the most obvious is to, to read it line by line and go and look through and examine what, what a poem's doing, because they do happen as a sequence, they are a sort of rhetorical arc and a rhetorical shape. Um, and you know something like a line break wouldn't happen if you if if you read from multiple um, directions. It, it's because you get to the end of the line that you have to go to the next line. Um, so working through a poem as a sequence does is naturally sort of lends itself to exploring how it functions. Um, but at the same time, there's lots of ways you can approach it thematically and and from outside, and and that's that's certainly good for wider discussion because part of what a poem does is it raises a question. It frames a question, and I always, I always encourage students to think of poems not as answers, but as questions. Um, what, what, what is the question that it's raising? One of the good techniques I've developed, um, the patented underwoodograph, is to draw a, a, an axis, and along the bottom axis, um, the X or the Y, I can't remember, um, that's, that's the time, that's like line by line working across. And then the upper axis is, is a much more sort of west coast kind of axis, where you, you're sort of responding. And individually, the students read through the poem and respond to the poem. Um, and of course, the, 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 the idea of the exercise isn't that the graph sort of says anything striking, but it's more that once you've made that mark and you've made that decision, you then have a, a graphical representation of peaks and troughs, of moments of interest, of moments of change. And, and students are much more likely to um, want to defend their, their graphs than they are their reading of a poem, say. So it can be a really interesting vehicle, um, and particularly when you get correlation or strong disagreements, that's a, a, a neat trick. What's your, who is your favourite poet to teach? Who's particularly yielding, you know, in the, in the seminar context? Well, I, I'm going to cheat and choose two poets. Um, the first poet I love to teach is Frank O'Hara, and I think that's part of, part of um, the reason is for the, um, as I said earlier, the, the complexity and the enjoyment, um, and off the page, he's somebody that you can immediately enjoy. Um, there's humour, there's a kind of ease, there's a kind of intimacy between um, the voice speaking to you and the address, uh, and uh, you as the addressee. Um, and, and also, there's a, you're excluded because often the poems are written, um, you know, for grace after a party or um, having a coke with you, and you're not having coke with Frank O'Hara, unfortunately. Um, so you're both privy to the world of the poem, and you feel that kind of intimacy, but you're also excluded from the context. And so there's a real sort of nice tension that you have to negotiate between um, what he leaves in um, and the, the gaps he leaves for you, the way that you have to inhabit and furnish a poem, and, and what he provides you with um, as a sort of handle on what's going on, on the text. Um, and I love teaching Lorca also because of things like um, when he says nobody knew how you martyred love's hummingbird between your teeth and <laughs> you have to try and explain how that works why that works and I think there's a real sort of thrill of realization that that as readers we're active we're participants because some, a line like that requires so much of our faculties of our imaginative associates associative material we have to bring that um, so actively into play um, that, that you realise how, how 
complicit you are in making a poem meaningful. And I think when students real realise that, they feel that poems aren't historical objects that, that they have to know stuff about, that, that necessarily they're, they're detached from them, that more that, more that they're, 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 they're present ongoing discourse, I suppose, that, that it's their investment in that provides them with worth and value. Students sometimes are a bit overwhelmed by, you know, technical terms in poetry, you know, yeah. like feet and rhythm and the music of the line. Do you teach that? How do you teach that? Yeah, I do. And um, I think it's always good to have, um, well, here's another way of putting it. Um, when you're talking about difficult concepts and specific concepts, it's useful to have terminology. There's a real sort of anti-jargon um, sort of wing in society. You hear lots of people, particularly in the arts as well, being very anti-jargon. Um, but there's a reason that jargon exists, that, that specific terminology exists, and that's because it, actually it's a shorthand. It's not a load of stuff you have to learn. Um, and I'd say the same thing actually. Um, a bit poets often don't think, oh I'm going to deploy the zeugma here. This is not <laughs> what they're interested in. Um, you go go on your gut or go on your nerve, as, as, as O'Hara says, he says, when someone pulls a knife on you on the street, you don't say, give it up buddy, I was a track star for Mili Miliola Prep, you, you just run. Um, and I think that's, it's about understanding that really, that, that, that poetry is not about um, deploying technical aspects for certain effects, but if you want to understand the question um, produced by each poem, then it can be useful to have those terms at your disposal when you're when you're talking about very specific, difficult things to discuss. It's not impossible to talk about them, you know, with Anglo-Saxon nouns like bread and head and mud and <laughs> that sort of stuff. But you you can do it. But it's a shorthand, isn't it? And that, that's 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 why it exists. Last question: yep. um, Students today, teaching them today, do they? Are they different from students of, say, you know, quite a few years ago? Do they, do they need more? Um, well, it, it, it's student to student, isn't it? I think mm. there are certain cultures of learning that might exist within schools, and, and, and in particular at home, um, and, and, and uh, the way that people engage with, with text and, and, and with stories and poems, that's very dependent on an individual. Um, I think, yes, there is... Um, probably less of an emphasis on um, on personal individual inquiry and the responsibility of you being complicit in in a poem or a um, or a story um, as a sort of, as part of its as an agent in its in its making um, and 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 a desire as a result among certain students to want to just simply get the raw facts the context the history. Um, because often in uh, AS level and A level they've been dealing in raw facts um, and I think part of the job of higher education actually is to encourage um, an erosion of that kind of dependency on on certain facts and instead to, to garner a kind of spirit of inquiry and to encourage um, another kind of value system and, and, and again, that, and that feeds into your wider life. It's, it's, everything isn't capital, value, power, class, money. It's, it's a way of looking at the world, relationships, um, yourself um, as being part of that. And I think that's ultimately what a, a university education brings to literature, is, is what, the understanding that you can then bring out of it.